I talked with artificial intelligence about the polyvagal theory, trauma recovery, and therapy. I also asked it if this very podcast is a good source for learning about the polyvagal theory. You might be surprised just like me, but it actually did pretty darn well. I only found one problem with what I was saying. So give it a listen and see if you can find anything else that I might have missed. My name is Justin Sinceri. I am a therapist and the creator of the Polyvagal Trauma Relief System. Welcome to Stuck Not Broken, where I teach you how to finally get relief from trauma using clear language and practical techniques. And we have some fun with AI. This podcast is not therapy, nor is it intended to be a replacement for therapy. I am not your therapist, nor is this AI your therapist. So yeah, I talked with um, artificial intelligence, it's chat GPT. Everyone's kind of talking about this right now. If you don't know what that is, that's fine. It's basically artificial intelligence, it's AI. So I'm gonna share what I prompted it with and then what it responded. I did do some editing just to kind of condense it because it gets repetitive and it likes to, I think, hear itself talk. So I, I kind of cut it back. Um, I also took the chat GPT, so the AI words, and voiced them with an AI voice. So this voice you're gonna hear is also AI. And if you're on YouTube, you'll be treated with a, to a visual of AI created art. So we have AI words, AI voice, and AI art, uh, the visual as well. So let's get into what it actually has to say. The first thing I asked for was, teach me about the political theory in under 500 words. The polyvagal theory is a neurobiological theory proposed by Dr. Stephen Porges that suggests that the autonomic nervous system is not a simple two-part system, but rather a complex, hierarchical system composed of three branches that have different evolutionary origins and serve different functions. Yeah, that first part, it pretty much got right. Uh, but let's, let's get more detail. The first and oldest branch is the dorsal vagal complex which is responsible for immobilization and dissociation in response to life-threatening situations. This branch is also known as the freeze response. Now, this is the only thing that I really caught as being a problem. And if you are a, an active listener to this, uh, this podcast, you know that the polyvagal shutdown state is not the same as freeze. These are words that get mixed up a lot, but these are distinct things. Shutdown is different than freeze, and I actually I actually ask it about that in a minute. So let's continue on with what uh, the AI has to say about polyvagal theory. The second branch is the sympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for the fight or flight response. This branch is activated in response to perceived danger or threat. Yeah, they got that right too. The third and most recent branch is the ventral vagal complex which is responsible for social engagement and connection. This branch is activated when we feel safe and secure in our environment and allows us to engage with others in a calm and connected way. I would say that, yes, it got it once again. The third and most recent branch is that ventral vagal, the myelinated ventral vagal pathways, responsible for safety and social connection. So another check. This next part I think is uh, interesting as well. According to the polyvagal theory, these three branches of the ANS interact and respond to each other in a hierarchical way. When we are faced with a potentially threatening situation, our ANS will first try to activate the ventral vagal complex. If this is not successful, it will then activate the sympathetic nervous system. If the threat is overwhelming or cannot be escaped, the dorsal vagal complex will be activated, leading to immobilization or dissociation. So what is this AI describing here? It's describing the polyvagal ladder. It understands or is at least able to put words to the idea of that, yeah, when we're in threatening situations, we come out of our safety state down into flight fight and then down into uh, shutdown uh, or freeze. So there, yeah, it didn't call it the polyvagal ladder, but it's describing the sequence of state shifts of the polyvagal ladder. It then transitions now into talking more about mental health and uh, trauma. The polyvagal theory has important implications for understanding and treating mental health disorders. For example, individuals who have experienced trauma may be stuck in a state of dorsal vagal immobilization, leading to symptoms such as dissociation, numbing, and depression. Treatment approaches that focus on activating the ventral vagal complex, such as mindfulness, social support, and physical exercise, can help individuals shift out of this state and move towards healing. Overall, 
The polyvagal theory provides a useful framework for understanding the complex ways in which our nervous system responds to different situations and how this can impact our mental and physical health. I would say overall so far the AI is doing a really good job of describing the polyvagal theory. That was, and this is that first 500 words that I'd asked it for. So I did ask it for something else to clarify. I said to it, you said the third and oldest branch is known as the freeze response. I have also heard it referred to as the shutdown response. And then I asked it, have you also heard the same thing? And this is its response. I apologize for the mistake in my previous response. The first and oldest branch of the autonomic nervous system, as you mentioned, is actually referred to as the shutdown response or the dorsal vagal response, rather than the freeze response. This response is associated with immobilization, dissociation, and conserving energy in response to life-threatening situations. The freeze response is a term that is often used to describe a specific aspect of this shutdown response, where an individual may feel paralyzed or unable to move in the face of a perceived threat. This term is more commonly used in the context of psychological trauma and is often associated with symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Thank you for bringing this to my attention, and I hope this clarifies any confusion. Then I told it, you are welcome. Thank you for confirming. Does the polyvagal theory have something to do with trauma? Yes, the polyvagal theory has significant implications for understanding trauma and its effects on the nervous system. Traumatic experiences can cause dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system, leading to a state of heightened arousal or a shutdown response. And what it's describing here is being stuck in a flight or fight or a shutdown or freeze. So it's, it's uh, describing being stuck in a defensive state, which is the definition of trauma through this somatic lens, specifically the polyvagal theory lens, is that trauma means that we are stuck in a defensive state. It goes on to say, When an individual experiences a traumatic event, the sympathetic nervous system may become activated, leading to the fight or flight response. If the threat is overwhelming or the individual is unable to escape, the dorsal vagal complex may become activated leading to a state of immobilization or dissociation. Over time, chronic stress and trauma can lead to dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system, resulting in symptoms such as anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder. What it's describing here I'm actually pretty impressed with because it's describing the two distinct paths to trauma or to being stuck in a traumatized state, the acute life threat reaction and the chronic disruption of connectedness. Like that's, I think it's Seriously, I'm, I'm just impressed at this point that it was able to name and differentiate those. It didn't name it the same way I did, but the concepts are there. And this next part is actually where I am even more impressed. According to the polyvagal theory, the ventral vagal complex plays a crucial role in healing from trauma. By focusing on activating the ventral vagal complex and promoting regulation of the autonomic nervous system, individuals can move towards greater well-being and recovery from trauma. I mean, this is not bad at all, right? It seems to understand uh, in its own way the role of the safety state in uh, in trauma recovery, which is absolutely crucial. Actually, that's the word that it used was plays a crucial role in healing from trauma. It is absolutely essential. And I would describe more of how that is, but it does that for me. I asked it, what would you recommend be the first step in trauma recovery when looked at from the viewpoint of the polyvagal theory. From the viewpoint of the polyvagal theory, the first step in trauma recovery is to establish a sense of safety and security. Creating a sense of safety is essential for promoting regulation of the nervous system and initiating the healing process. It actually gives us some recommendations on how to do this, but just for time's sake, I'm going to take that out. But I'll put it in the description if you want to read its four uh, responses or its four recommendations that to, to establish a sense of safety and security, as it calls it, then I just go to the description and you'll find it there. But what I ended up following up with is I said, oh, so safety needs to be built within someone who is traumatized before they begin to process traumatic memories and build resilience? Question mark. Yes, that's correct. According to the polyvagal theory, 
safety and security are essential for promoting regulation of the nervous system and initiating the healing process. Establishing a sense of safety and security is critical before an individual can begin to process traumatic memories and build resilience. By addressing safety and regulation first, individuals can better tolerate the emotional and physiological arousal that may arise when processing traumatic memories. And it actually touches upon something here that's really important as well and is very much a polyvagal thing, which is building the strength of the vagal break. It understands that having that safety, that vagal break development is so important before beginning trauma work. It knows that this can lead to more distress tolerance. And we know, I don't know if it knows it, but we know that it actually might even lead to some curiosity about what it's like to have that stuck defensive state, to be able to welcome it, to be able to normalize it, validate it, and actually be curious about what it's like to, to, uh, to have that within, within our bodies. But yeah, it's, it's identifying the vagal break here and, and the importance of building that before moving forward with trauma work. So then I asked it, do you think it's ever a good idea for a trauma survivor to ignore being in their polyvagal safety state and just start processing the traumatic experiences they have been through? No, it is generally not recommended for a trauma survivor to ignore being in their polyvagal safety state and just start processing traumatic experiences. Trauma can dysregulate the autonomic nervous system, leading to a state of hyperarousal or shutdown, and ignoring the importance of safety can exacerbate this dysregulation and make the healing process more difficult. When an individual is in a state of dysregulation, processing traumatic experiences can be overwhelming and re-traumatizing. It is essential to work with a trained therapist or healthcare provider who understands the polyvagal theory and can guide the individual through the process of establishing safety and regulation before beginning to process traumatic memories. And this is like, I completely agree. And this is exactly how I work as a therapist. This is how I created my, my polyvagal trauma relief system. Yeah, this is how I work. And I hopefully, I, you know, if you're working with someone who's polyvagal informed, that they're doing the same thing. The safety state is so unbelievably important to have that active and to build the strength of it before going into, if they're going to go, if you're going to go into the more direct trauma work. We don't want to re-traumatize people. We don't want to just bring up these things all over again and then just have it be reinforced. That's not what we want. That would probably be the opposite of what we want. It goes on to say, Additionally, it's important to note that the process of trauma recovery can take time and may involve several steps. Rushing through the process or skipping steps can lead to further dysregulation and can ultimately impede progress towards healing and recovery. Therefore, it's important for trauma survivors to take the time they need to establish safety, regulate their nervous system, and work with a trained professional to develop a personalized approach to healing that works for them. And then I asked, is therapy necessary for someone living in a traumatized state to live a happier and more connected life? While therapy is not necessarily a requirement for everyone who has experienced trauma to live a happier and more connected life, it can be an effective tool for healing and promoting resilience. Therapy can provide a safe and supportive environment for individuals to process traumatic experiences, develop coping strategies, and learn new skills for managing stress and regulating their nervous system. This got me curious. I, wonder, I was wondering if, well, can this AI, does it understand how the therapeutic relationship benefits someone. So I asked, how does the therapeutic relationship benefit someone who is traumatized? What does the polyvagal theory have to say about this relationship and how it helps? And I was pretty darn impressed with its response. According to the polyvagal theory, the ventral vagal complex plays a crucial role in social engagement and connection, and the therapeutic relationship can activate this branch of the nervous system and promote healing. The therapeutic relationship provides a safe and supportive environment where individuals can develop a sense of trust and connection with their therapist. This can be particularly important for individuals who have experienced trauma, as they may struggle with trust and have difficulty forming close relationships. And yeah, it's right. You know, it's a professional relationship, but this actually might be the first experience of safety and of connection for that client, especially if they've been you know, raised with that complex or uh, that chronic disruption of connectedness and um, they have that complex PTSD 
um, they really may not have much of a reference point for safety. And ideally, we want that to come from family and friends and coworkers, but it may not. And so getting that through some sort of professional relationship is completely okay. And, and that can build a reference point for safety that can build the strength of those safety pathways. It goes on to say, By engaging with a therapist who is attuned to their needs and understands the impact of trauma on the nervous system, individuals can begin to build a sense of safety and regulation. The therapist can provide support and guidance as the individual works through traumatic memories and develops coping strategies for managing stress and dysregulation. In that bit, it's talking more about therapeutic interventions. And it actually had gone into more detail, but I took out uh, that to save time. But it's talking about therapeutic interventions. And the next part I was pretty impressed with. The therapeutic relationship can also activate the ventral vagal complex, which can promote relaxation, connection, and a sense of well-being. By engaging in activities such as eye contact, facial expressions, and tone of voice, the therapist can help the individual feel safe and connected and promote the healing process. What's it talking about here? We know that this is co-regulation. It's actually naming or identifying a few pieces like the gentle eye contact, having facial expressions versus flat affect, the tone of voice, what we call vocal prosody. These things are the therapist's cues of safety. These things are given out and hopefully picked up on by the client. And that is the process of co-regulation when the client picks up on it and it helps them to shift into their own safety state. I said to it, wow, thank you. Where did you learn all this information and what sources do you use? I took this out as well because it was a lengthy answer, but it is in the description. If you want to know what, you know, what sources it uses, I put, I just copy pasted it over to the description. It also gives some book recommendations uh, from the primary sources, which I thought was fantastic. I got curious and I asked it, is the Stuck Not Broken podcast a good source for learning about the polyvagal theory? And sadly, this is what it said. I'm not familiar with the Stuck Not Broken podcast, but there are many resources available on the polyvagal theory, and it's important to approach any source with a critical eye and seek out reputable sources that are grounded in scientific research and clinical practice. And that kind of hurt my, my ego a little bit there, I'll use that word. But no, realistically, it doesn't because the way that this AI stuff learns, it's not like up to date. It's not, it has a ton of information that's been fed into it. But if you ask it about current events, if you ask it about uh, newer podcasts and whatnot, it, it, it may not know what the heck you're talking about. I asked it about Brad Pitt and knew that. I asked it about me, it had no idea. I'm just not relevant enough yet. What it did give me though is five different ways for you to evaluate a polyvagal source. And so what I invite you to do, I'm going to play these here. And I invite you to ask yourself these questions about this podcast, but also about other polyvagal resources that you might be taking in. Um, not all of these resources are created equally. Not all of them are, are building their information from the primary sources. Actually, in my commun my, my private community for my course students, somebody had shared a what looked like a polyvagal informed image or infographic and we I, I had you know posted it for everyone to you know to kind of dissect and there was a few things that this person got wrong and so all my polyvagal 101 course students they were able to be like oh this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong here's what the ai recommends for you when it comes to evaluating the sources and then that uh, we'll wrap it up after that when evaluating a source some questions to consider include is the source based on scientific research and clinical practice? Is the information presented in a clear and accessible way? Does the source provide practical strategies for applying the polyvagal theory in daily life or clinical practice? Does the source acknowledge the complexity and nuance of trauma and the nervous system? Does the source emphasize safety and regulation as essential for healing from trauma? I hope you enjoyed that. I was actually pretty darn impressed uh, that it was able to express the polyvagal theory pretty darn clearly and accurately. I only had really one issue with it. But what did you think? Feel free to email me at justinlmft at gmail.com. Did you pick up on anything that I didn't see? Because I, I think it did. A, I was shocked. I'm like seriously, seriously surprised that it did a good job, I think. It is kind of scary 
um, to think about what could be possible with a tool like this and also our uh, culture of mass consumption of information and entertainment and whatnot. And I was able to put together this plus, so I use the AI for this, I use AI for the voice, I use AI for the image on YouTube and probably for the YouTube um, thumbnail as well. At some point, we're going to have AI be able to make entire movies for us. It's not perfect, but it's pretty scary. So I, I really encourage you to scrutinize the heck out of whatever source you're taking in, including mine, including mine as well. Scrutinize the heck out of it. I have started to implement some AI things, not just the the imagery, um, like on YouTube, but on my, on my website, I've started using some thumbnails for, that use AI art or quote unquote art. But I've also used this AI that created, you know, these, the answers for this. I've started using that f uh, to take my, um, like my YouTube or my blog and, and to summarize what's in it. So I could use that for like SEO stuff. But I've also used it to give me ideas and, and I can use that to, uh, to as a springboard on what to provide for you as well. So I'm, I am using these as a tool. I, in no way am I relying on them. I use it more as a tool that I then refine and sculpt into uh, what is more accurate and based on primary sources because it definitely gets stuff wrong. But in this instance, it did pretty darn good. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. I actually have a gift for you. It's a nifty gifty. It is my polyvagal checklist. If you go to justinlmft.com slash polyvagal checklist, you can download it for free. Simply sign up for my email list and you'll be able to download, download that right away. And you can use that checklist as a guide or as you're doing your polyvagal research to check off what you're learning. But yeah, you could also use it as a guide on what to learn next. That's on justinlmft.com slash polyvagal checklist. And of course, there'll be a link in the description. Fellow stuck now, I'm not sure if this episode is helpful in your trauma recovery, but I think it's just kind of fun and interesting, at least for me. I'm not just a polyvagal nerd, but I'm also, I like this kind of tech nerdy AI stuff, or at least I'm interested in, and I, I have some time to play around with it. I hope you enjoyed that as well. Bye. This podcast is not therapy, not intended to be therapy or be a replacement for therapy. Nothing in this creates or indicates a therapeutic relationship. Please consult with your therapist or seek for one in your area if you are experiencing mental health symptoms. Nothing in this podcast should be construed to be specific life advice. It is for educational and entertainment purposes only. More resources are available in the description of this episode and in the footer of justinlmft.com.